Morning, Northrop and Nikon just announced the new D500, their 70 Mark II killer. This is their wildlife and sports camera, and I believe it might just be the very best wildlife and sports camera for most of the world. Let's take a deeper look at it. It's a little brother to the big $6,500 Nikon D5 that I have another preview for. This just shows the relative size. You can see it's substantially smaller and lighter, and that's a huge benefit. People, some people like a big, huge, heavy camera. That D5 is built like a tank, but it's also really heavy, and if, especially for us wildlife photographers who go out in the field and need to hike, uh, if you can get something in a smaller body, you will definitely appreciate it. I'm sure the D500 is gonna be a very durable camera. I'm sure it has some weather sealing. I'm also sure it's not quite as durable as the D6500. It's a 20, one megapixel camera basically, which is less than other cameras like the D7200, a lower end Nikon camera that's 24 megapixels. So why is the megapixel size lower? Well, that allows for faster frame rates. 24 megapixel picture has more detail, takes more time to move it across that camera and onto your memory card. So the camera can be a little bit faster if the pictures themselves are a little bit smaller. That gives it the ability to take 10 pictures every second. That's really, really, really fast. Most cameras are three to five pictures per second. Even more expensive cameras can only, like the DA10, can only do six frames a second. 10 frames a second is astonishing. And we shoot that all the time for sports with our Canon 7D Mark II, and they hit that exact same number. In fact, you'll see a lot of parallels between the D500 and Canon's competitor, the 7D Mark II. The D500 beats the 7D Mark II in this way. It can store 200 consecutive shots with compressed RAW files. But I, I'm not afraid of the compressed RAW files. If you want to shoot uncompressed RAW files, if you're that type, you can still get 71 shots. And that's a whole lot. That's a whole lot more than the 7D Mark II. And what that means is that if you're a wildlife photographer, a bird is coming towards you, uh, you know, you have maybe five or 10 seconds that you want to be shooting, just trying to get that perfect shot and the 7D Mark II is gonna run out after, I don't know what it is, like 35 frames or something like that, and the bird will still be coming towards you. So what you have to do is you have to pace yourself. You have to let off the shutter and go back to shooting and let off and let that buffer catch up a little bit. With the D500, you'll be able to just hold the shutter down and just click pictures as fast as you can without having to worry about filling up that buffer. I know I'll be shooting compressed. This compressed number here with the 200 shots counts on you having a very fast QXD card. Depending on the size you get, um, these run from like 125 bucks all the way up to 400 bucks for like 32 gigs to 128 gigs. So they're a little more expensive than SD cards, but they're also faster. Uh, this camera takes both a CF and a QXD card, one of each. So the QXD card is going to be higher performance, but also more expensive. CF card more versatile. The viewfinder is uh, notable on this camera. It has 100% viewfinder coverage, which means you can see. When you look through the optical viewfinder, you can see the left pixel and the very rightmost pixel. That's the way every mirrorless camera works, but it's not the way every DSLR works. Sometimes the edges are just, you just don't know what the edges are. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. This is, a lot of us end up cropping our pictures anyway, but you don't necessarily see the whole frame. You will on this camera. The magnification is 1x, which means the light that hits your eye is the exact same magnification as the light that hits the sensor. More magnification is better. We like a nice big, viewfinder. Now, the Nikon D5, the $6,500 big brother to this camera, has a 0.71x magnification. So why is the Nikon's magnification worse? Well, because the Nikon just happens to have a bigger sensor. So you're actually getting more light with the full frame D5. You're getting less light with the D500. But the, the, it's basically like the same prism. It's just that this one's cropped down a little bit. This camera also supports 4K, and that's big news. That's huge news. When I discussed this on the D5, I was hugely disappointed, but I'm thrilled with this camera. It actually shoots 4K 30 frames a second for up to 30 minutes. There's a weird caveat with this. While the D5 would record 4K for three minutes at most, a ridiculous and embarrassing restriction, <laughs> the D500 can records three-minute consecutive files. So it will record, record for three minutes and then start a new file that records for three minutes, and it will record, I guess, 10 of those up to 29 minutes and 59 seconds because of European taxation restrictions and nonsense like that. Anyway, so it can record 30 minutes of 4K footage, which makes it usable. In post-processing, 
you'd have to stitch those files together, but it wouldn't be a big deal. You'd basically drag them all into your editing software, and, and I'm assuming it doesn't drop any frames in between, so it should just be a functioning video camera with one extra step. Congrats Nikon on making a proper 4K camera. Um, this is also internal recording. You can record through HDMI to an external recorder like an Atomos Assassin, but it's great to not have to do that. Those are expensive. However, one big caveat is that the 4K recording has an extra 1.5x crop factor. So the camera, is, this is confusing because this is an APS-C camera. It has a 1.5x crop factor compared to a full-frame camera. Full-frame or 4K recording has a further 1.5x crop factor leading to a total crop factor of 2.2x when you're recording 4K video. That means that you won't get, your, your wide-angle lenses will be a little bit more telephoto than you would think. Basically, this means you have an effective sensor size, the same as a micro four-thirds camera, roughly. Uh, so you're going to get about the same image quality as you would out of like a Panasonic GH4 $1,000 video camera that might actually be more capable in some ways. But as far as doing double duty for action and 4K video, this is still going to be a much better choice. Why is it 1.5x on the 4K video? Because this 21 megapixel sensor uh, compares to an 8 megapixel 4K video feed it's smaller, right? So what Nikon is doing is they're taking the 8 megapixels from the center of this 21 megapixel sensor, and that crop factor would end up being 1.5x. They're just cropping it down. They're doing a 1 to 1 pixel read. They're not skipping pixels. They're just dropping pixels at the end of the frame. Just to give you some idea of how much is being cropped out, just look at these uh, yellow lines here. This is about the crop that you would get. It's a significant crop. It means you'd have to often switch to a different lens. It means you might have to get a super wide angle lens when you just want a normal wide angle video footage. It also means you won't get the same shallow depth of field when you're at the same equivalent focal length of your existing lenses. It makes everything kind of a pain. Uh, if you are looking for a 4K video camera as your top priority, I would instead push you to something like that camera over there, an A7R2 or an A7S2. Uh, you'll see that they added a couple of good video features like this is what's called zebras. It shows you the parts of the picture that are a little bit overexposed. That's a standard feature in video cameras, but in DSLRs it's been kind of unheard of. Uh, I mentioned that it has HDMI out for external recording. They also have a novel feature that they're calling electronic vibration reduction. So in Nikon branded lenses, they have their version of image stabilization is vibration reduction. It cancels out some of the movements of your hand. So if you're taking a still photo, it will let you get longer shutter speeds without showing camera shake. When you're recording video, electronic vibration reduction works with the optical vibration reduction to stabilize some of the movement. All, all it's doing is shifting pixels up and down. So if you move your body up a little bit, it will compensate for that by reading lower pixels from the sensor. That means it, it only works with standard Ultra HD like 1080p video and it doesn't read out the whole frame. So it's going to crop in the edges of the frame, allowing the sensor to kind of, the sensor is actually reading to kind of move around on the physical sensor. The sensor is not moving in and of itself. It's not like, like Olympus's IBIS, the in-body image stabilization, or Sony's steady shot. Unfortunately, those are fantastic technologies that we would love to see in Nikon bodies, but we haven't yet. This is an electronic version of it. It's not as good. You could exactly replicate this, probably replicate it in a better way by using something like Warp Stabilizer in post-processing. But you're getting it in camera, and Warp Stabilizer is a pain to use. So it is, it's a nice to have. It's just not a magic optical fix. As I mentioned earlier, it takes two different cards. This is incredibly useful for, for professionals who often need to have an instant backup. CF cards fail, SD cards fail, and if one of them fails and you only have one card, then you lose your shots for the day. If you're traveling, I went to Machu Picchu recently using a Sony camera that only had a single SD card. I was scared to death that that SD card was going to fail and I would lose, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of pictures because that trip was expensive. With a camera like this, you can record two cards simultaneously. It can be a lifesaver. It's, it's a little unusual that they would choose to mix, uh, actually it's an SD card and an XQD card. Um, but it's nice that the SD card is versatile and inexpensive. You can pick them up anywhere. SD card readers are also really popular and built into most computers. So you have one common format and one uncommon format, but high performance format. 
you're going to be using that XQD for all your high performance shots and then maybe just storing a JPEG back up to the SD card. To give you some idea, uh, well, move on. Another important feature is the tilting touchscreen. This is fantastic to have in a, like a professional grade camera. The tilting allows you to lift the camera over your head and shoot over a crowd and still have a good perspective on it. And you can shift down low towards the ground when you're working on a tripod, for example, and still see it. It also is really useful for video since you're almost always working on a tripod and you might have the tripod above or below your head. Anyway, tilt screens are absolutely fantastic. Touch screens allow you to touch to focus. They also allow you to quickly scan through your pictures. That's what Nikon is illustrating here. You can grab the frame advance bar and, well, flip through the hundreds of pictures that you might take in, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. It's much faster than having to push the button multiple times or roll a wheel. Custom white balance can be set by simply touching the screen where you want it to be white. Much easier than having to set a custom white balance with buttons. You can also use it to type notes, your copyright information, connect to your uh, Wi-Fi access point with that security code. Typing that out with the buttons and a thumb dial was always a pain. That kind of thing will be much easier now. My favorite aspect of using a touchscreen is the ability to pull apart to quickly zoom into parts of a picture. And, you know, if you're taking a landscape picture and you want to make sure you have sufficient depth of field, you'll need to zoom in. You'll need to check the front of your focal range and the back of your focal range and make sure everything is acceptably sharp. That's always been a pain with a thumbstick and a zoom button, but with a touchscreen, it can happen in just a couple of seconds. Thank you, Nikon, for giving us a touchscreen. Another huge thing that I'm, I'm pumped about, this might be what I'm most excited about, is SnapBridge. And I know a lot of people are going to dismiss this because it's, it's a gadget, it's electronic, it's not core to photography. But what SnapBridge does is it maintains a constant Bluetooth connection between your smartphone and the camera. And it will use that Bluetooth connection to, well, send GPS data, uh, you know, like attach GPS data to your pictures, which is really useful. It will also send copies of your pictures to the phone. And that way you can pull your smartphone out at any time and send a picture over to Instagram or Twitter. You don't have to worry about like connecting up the Wi-Fi network and picking it and sending it over. Your picture should just appear on your phone. And this is a big step forward if it works properly. We haven't tested it. We're looking forward to testing it. And sometimes these things don't work quite as well as they would have you believe. But if it works as well as you, as you might believe, then uh, it's, it's gonna, it could potentially be a game changer because nowadays, they just showed you in that video, she reached for the phone in her pocket, but then thought, no, I'm going to actually take this with a real camera. And that's what a lot of us, even professional photographers do, is take pictures with our smartphones because it's too much trouble to get the picture from your camera to the smartphone and then to Instagram. Sometimes I'll even use my smartphone to take a picture of the back of the camera. But hopefully Snap, uh, what is it called? <laughs> SnapBridge will fix all that for us, send the pictures automatically to our phone, they'll be there instantly, no fussing with the Wi-Fi. Illuminated buttons on this camera will make night photography a breeze. 153 focus points, just like the D5. And mo more importantly, they fill up the frame. They fill it up right to the edge. Now these focus points are the same size as those in the, the D5, but the D5 is a full frame camera, Therefore, the focusing points only cover, you know, half the frame, basically, like the middle half of it. But on the 1.5x crop factor camera, they will fill up the entire frame, meaning you never have to do the focus recompose anymore when you want an off-center composition. That's not an option for action anyway, and this is an action camera. That means you can follow the rule of space. You can have the guy running from first base to second base. You can have him in the left part of the frame, giving you a nice and beautiful composition. Those cross-type focusing points are spread all throughout the frame, so tracking action should be no problem at all. If you use a teleconverter and your lens is effectively an f8 lens, you still have 15 focusing points that you can focus with. They're all in the middle, but some of them spread out a little bit, and that gives you some uh, leverage for composing it. You can get out to basically a rule of thirds composition, even at f8. And that's, that's kind of a big deal. You can't do that in the Canon world. In the Canon world, you have f8 autofocus on a couple of bodies, but it's only the center autofocus point. And then it screws up my photography, like in the real world. I want to be able to do off-center compositions, and sometimes you have no choice. Like if you're, if you're shooting a bird coming towards you and it's fairly close, you'll want to be focusing on the eye. But if you want to fill the frame with the bird, 
the eye will be like maybe in the left third or the right third so that the rest of the bird isn't going off the edge of the frame. You just can't do that with Canon. You just can't do it because you can only focus with the center autofocus point. Thank you Nikon for providing that amazing feature in a $2,000 body. That's, that's a big deal. By comparison, these are the 7D Mark II's focusing points. You can see they go really close to the edge. But as we flip back and forth, the D500 focusing points go out much closer to the edge. They both have great coverage, but the D500 here is the clear winner. Let's look at the D7200, the next level down Nikon camera, and you can see the D500 has far more focusing spread. Uh, this is just so fantastic. As somebody who hates focus recompose, <laughs> I'm really happy about that. Nikon's advertising a maximum ISO of 50,000, uh, and you can extend it up to ISO 1,600. These are meaningless numbers. They do not reflect the actual image quality that you'll get out of it. We could just make it extend up to ISO 18 billion. Whatever, because it's just, it's just software based. It's just like artificial gain. It's just like turning up the, the music on your computer. It doesn't mean that your speakers are going to sound better or even output more. It's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just fake. So we'll actually test the image quality as soon as we can get our hands on one. Subscribe to be sure to see that. Just like the D5, the D500 has what they call an auto AF fine tune. And if you're a person who, who finds that you consistently front or back focus with a particular lens, this is a, a defect that DSLRs have because the phase detect uh, focusing system can get out of line with the actual sensor. Nikon has a system that will make, this, make tuning this much easier than it has been in the past. You simply focus with live view, which is always, always accurate because it's not using off-sensor focusing systems. And then you say, okay, that's in focus. And then you let the camera calibrate itself. It handles it all in camera. This can save you many hours of work. It really can. And uh, I, I'm excited to see that. It'll also be a great way to actually test your lenses. If you're, if you're interested in micro adjustments like that, check chapter five of Stending Digital Photography. I have a whole section that helps you go through it. Most people spend more time than they should on that. $2,000 coming in March 2016. If you want to pick up a copy, visit this link and we get a few pennies to help support us. sdp.io slash d500. We're pretty pumped about it. Who is this camera for? Sports and wildlife photographers. We'll play with it soon. But right now, I'm guessing it's the very best sports and wildlife camera in the world. And that, that title has been held for a long time by the Canon 7D Mark II. But this has some key advantages over the 7D Mark II. Let's jump forward to them. This is just a side-by-side -side of the 7D Mark II on the left and the D500 on the right. The D500 has so many advantages. The 7D Mark II is cheaper at $1,500 compared to $2,000. The 7D Mark II has GPS built in. And the D500 has 4K video. It has more shots in the buffer, far more shots that it can take consecutively. I'm guessing it's going to have cleaner image quality just because Nikon tends to be ahead of Canon. They tend to have better dynamic range and lower noise. It's going to have far more focusing points and those focusing points are wider. This is kind of important, especially if you're shooting video. It has a touch tilt screen. I find that just tremendously useful for general shooting. It also has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC. So just the ability to get stuff to my phone. I'm really pumped about this camera. Let's see how it compares to its big brother, the D500. You can see the scale of uh, the D5 versus the D500. The D5 is a far bigger, far heavier, far bulkier camera. Some people love that. These people are, are putting the vertical grips on their smaller cameras because they want them to be physically bigger. I've never done that. I hate the vertical grip. I want my camera to be smaller and lighter. That's just my camp. So I'm happy about the D500. Here's a top view. You can see uh, they're, they're basically identical. The, the layout of the buttons is slightly different. And on the front, the D500 doesn't have quite as many function buttons. It's missing one of the function buttons. But otherwise, you can definitely see the family resemblance. Functionally, they're, they're almost identical, despite the massive, massive price gap. They're both, you know, basically 21 megapixels. They, uh, their frame rate is very similar. D500 at 10 frames a second. The D5 can go 12 frames a second in, in regular usage. The biggest difference is the D5 is a full-frame camera with a 1x crop factor. The D500 has a sensor that's a little bit less than half the size with a 1.5x crop factor. That means at, at a given ISO, you can expect the D500 to have a little bit more than twice as much noise. Uh, it's going to be about twice as noisy, basically. But 
the smaller sensor is actually an advantage to most of us shooting sports and wildlife because it, it brings you closer and it extracts more detail from the center of your lens. That, that means that in those times when you have to crop anyway, which is really common for wildlife and sports photographers, you'll be getting more detail than if you were shooting with a D5. Now you'll get more detail out of the D5 if you have a big enough lens that you can fill the frame and not have to crop because you'll just be using more of that big full frame lens. And most of the sports and wildlife lenses that we'll be using will be designed for full frame cameras anyway. So for the hardcore pros that will have a 600 or 800 millimeter lens, whatever exactly they need to fill the frame, the D5 is a far better choice. If you only have a budget of a couple of grand and you can't get quite close enough to that um, bald eagle, the D500 with its smaller sensor is gonna crop automatically for you and overall be a better choice. The D5 is bigger, more durable, has a vertical grip, but the D500 has all those awesome Wi-Fi features and actually records 4K, actually functional 4K, which the D5 simply lacks. Some things disappoint me about the camera, but overall, I, I, I have fewer complaints about this camera than any camera that we've ever previewed. This is really, really exciting news. It still has those crappy retro LCD screens on the top. Yes, there are better options, things like e-ink, things like uh, just regular color displays can be designed to be low on power usage, visible in daylight, and look much nicer, also allowing a reconfigurable display. It's time to get those in there. It still doesn't have good video AF, at least not that Nikon is advertising. Cameras like the 7D Mark II and the Canon 70D have phase detect focusing on the sensor itself. A7R2 from Sony as well. And these cameras mean that it means you can track moving subjects while you're recording video. And every Nikon camera I've ever used has been appalling at that. Appalling. So you really can't refocus while you're recording video. And they didn't mention that they improved it, so they probably didn't, which means your best option is going to be manually focusing. You can refocus while you're recording video, but the focusing is going to be all jerky and you wouldn't want to watch it back later. So that's it's going to limit its functionality for a lot of different types of videography. It also lacks focus peaking, which is what you would need to do proper manual focusing. So it lacks good auto focusing for video. It also lacks focus peaking for video. So both of those are, are kind of disappointing. This wraps up the overview of the D500. If you want one, go to sdp.io slash D500. We will definitely have a hands-on review just as soon as we can get one. So subscribe to see that. Give me a like to help support these sort of in, uh, detailed, in-depth reviews and share it with your friends. If you have any follow-up questions, just add a comment down below. Thanks a lot.